You already answered my question, but I'll come up with another one. Okay. Um, <laughs> you, you were watching us watch the film. Where did you get a laugh that you completely surprised you? Um, let me think. I mean, a lot of times I feel like I, I don't I don't hear when people are laughing, but it's just you guys were very um, vocal about it, and it was so nice, you know, because when you sit with a film and you edit it, and you know, I I, I mean, I babysat every edit with the editor. Um, you get really really used to all the jokes, and you get used to all the dialogue, and 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 you you begin to not not trust it, and so it's nice to you know sit with an audience and. And, and I was surprised at how many um, laughs continued all the way through the final, final scene tonight, which was nice. Um, but it's different for, for everybody, and you know, every, you, know, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a private experience, but yet it's a communal experience when you're watching a film. And also, you know, unfortunately, independent films, a lot of them are, you know, being seen on TVs now. I mean, will have a you know they have a brief run in, in the theaters, but then people are going to be watching them at home, you know. So uh, with you know one or two other people, so um, it's it's a real treat when you get to you know experience it with a whole audience. It, it was interesting. I Carrie was nice enough to let me come in on the last month of editing, and I sat and, and uh, watched her and Anita work on it, and uh, we would sit and decide how long should we wait. You don't know because you have no. You have to anticipate if people are going to laugh or not going to laugh. You don't want them to miss the next line, but you don't want to have dead space either. So it's just a really interesting. I had never had that experience. I mean, we both work in a the theater, so if we're on stage live, it's easy to decide when to come in for the next line, or when to hold or milk it or whatever you're going to do. Uh, but uh, it's harder to know when one is editing a film. You know how how much time do you leave? So I think we did a pretty good job. Yeah, there we were a couple of times I was like, oh, I should have held a little longer there, but you know, whatever. <laughs> all I see are all those little things that nobody's going to notice except for me and my, you know, crazy little brain. <laughs> yeah? Hey. Yeah? Uh, um, so I know you said you rehearsed, but like, um, how, how many shots did you find you were usually taking for each scene? You mean how many like takes per setup? Um, well, generally, like there are some days that I, I was able to squeeze in, I think my longest was like maybe 26 setups in one day, which is a lot. Uh -huh. and, um, but that's only because I storyboarded the entire film. And so um, I, I did that so I could be profoundly prepared for all the chaos that happens on the day that you're actually shooting. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I was able to be fluid within that. Um, but generally, we would do three or four takes at the most. Um, there were a couple of, you know, a couple of times when I did, I think the most takes I did um, was maybe 10. Well, on that scene when the two of them, right at the end, uh, to, right before they get to the Chinatown dive bar and they're arguing and they're walking down Chinatown, um, I, uh, I wanted that to be one continuous shot and I had to, had to end up doing some edits in there because um, the light was going because we were using um, the storefront lights to light the scene and it was getting later and later and they were all closing down. So then uh, my DP <laughs> had to string uh, basically a huge china ball on the end of a stick and, uh, and someone was running behind the camera um, with it, and every time the camera would circle around them and land in this one spot, you would see the shadow of the entire camera crew on the actors. <laughs> and um, so we couldn't, you know, we just couldn't, couldn't fix that, so. Um, and Marcia's toe was broken. And Marcia's toe was broken, that's right. She had broken her toe when we did the um, fight scene. <laughs> yeah. Those bruises are real. Those bruises are. Are real, yeah, I know. We had an amazing fight choreographer. It wasn't his fault. The girls just got so into it. <laughs> um, but anyway, that was probably the most takes. Generally, it was you know maybe three or four takes per sap. Yeah. But I knew because it was so dialogue heavy that I I I wanted to do a lot of coverage because um, I didn't want the eye to ever get tired. So um, so it was fun to edit because we had so many things to pick from.
even if we only had three or four takes per setup. Anybody else? Oh, hey. Hi, I've seen Anne Hayes do comedy before. But this was really quite good, and I, I'm not familiar with the other actress, but did either of them bring an element of surprise to you as a director and you as a writer? I know there wasn't anything that was ad-libbed. You, you did say that, but were there things that they brought in terms of their skills and stuff that surprised you, that worked? She's asking if any of the actors brought any elements of surprise that we weren't expecting. Um, well, Marsha, I mean, you know, she had done the play from the beginning, so I knew what she was going to bring, but we, I mean, Alia was probably the biggest surprise because she didn't audition I had only see, we'd only seen her in you know I mean she has a great body of work for someone so young but the the role of Clementine is so particular it's tricky yeah. it's a tricky part and um and we were just pleasantly surprised by um, how she fleshed that character out and um, she is like a little machine I mean that girl's been acting since she was this big so it was like fine tuning. A, I mean, I would just give her one little note, and she would, she would fine tune it, and she was amazing with that. Like she had just, just such skill um, for someone so young. And then, um, you know, Anne was like working with a passionate bolt of lightning. She's uh, incredible, and she, she came with so many great ideas, things that I hadn't considered before things that Kelly hadn't, she was very, um, she was, uh, she wanted to talk to us, she wanted to, she was extraordinarily game, she was and just game. really yeah, on the ball of our feet, and we were so appreciative of that, I mean, she's super talented, obviously, anyway, yeah. but um, when she decided she wanted to do the, the movie, she, she just came a thousand percent, and I mean, so much so that she so actually happened. lost her voice. Yeah, yeah. So that whole first scene, you know, when she sounds so hoarse, that she really, because she had already, you know, thrown her voice out, just you know, rehearsing and getting into the character and smoking. <laughs> She's a little method. Um, that Kelly had to write a line in about, you know, you're dehydrated, and that's why you always lose your voice. <laughs> what are we gonna do? Yeah, there were some I'll challenges in the um, in the editing of that to to because there were some takes where she was you couldn't she was so hoarse that we couldn't you know use some of that. But you know, Anne is one of those people that you know is an embarrassment of riches when you're picking out what what you know what uh, take to use. We we couldn't have been more blessed. I mean, it was the perfect yeah. perfect cast it in was. my opinion. So. It was. Yes? Sisters, kind yeah. of. It was actually funny though because, um, <laughs> you know, I I played the role of Elise. Uh, That's right. With I always dark keep, hair. You know, she has the dark hair. She plays Elise, yeah. the lawyer. And um, I wasn't going to be. It's okay. I wasn't going to be in in it at all. And then my husband said, "Oh, you could play that part." And I said, "Yes, I want to be in it." So yes. I'm going to do, do that. I cast myself. And um, Carrie would get mad at me because when we were rehearsing, I was the one who didn't know my lines. She didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> because I was so worried about watching the scenes and making sh my my focus was really split. And then when we were shooting, you know, actors have I know this might be a surprise, but we have egos and they're very delicate. So uh, we like to get a lot of positive feedback. And and when we were shooting, I knew that I had to take care of her because she was my director. But then when I was doing my scenes, I wanted her to tell me how good I was. She was <laughs> too busy doing something else and I had to really suck it up and just say I'm going to trust her and I'm not going to make her you know compliment me right now so it was really funny it was really funny the dynamics that we were shifting constantly so yeah yeah I mean Kelly and I've known each other for so long that there were you know some days um, on the set when I would just be frustrated by you know just the enormity of it and she would be the one that I would go to and just go I need to vent can I just talk to you about this one thing and and she was a great, uh, you know, receptacle of my, you know, rage at times. <laughs> but, um, it's okay. It's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. Yeah. And I would do the same for her. Was that was that take okay? I was like, yes, yes. <laughs> I didn't think I actually asked. Did I ask? Nope. I did. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I wanted. 
I, I really wanted Kelly there the whole time because, and that's why I invited her into the editing room because I really wanted her to be happy with the way that I was interpreting her. Script. That never happens, I don't think. I, I, I mean, I don't think it happens often. I don't think it happens much, but I really wanted to make sure that she was pleased with, you know, what we were doing with her, her baby. So, she seems happy with that. <laughs> happy. How did you uh, pick the music? The music was really, really oh, good. Oh, thanks for asking yeah, about the music. Yeah, he was asking really about good. the music. We got extremely lucky through friend, a friend of Kelly and her husband, Joe. Joe's also one of the producers. Joe's a musician. And a friend of his is Mike Viola. And Mike is um, very well known in, in the um, indie uh, rock scene. He also he, he, wrote, he wrote some of the music for rock, um, Walk Hard. Walk Hard, the Dewey and, Cox story. And, and Get Him to the Greek. Get Him to the Greek and That Thing You Do. And so he, he's very well known in the, um, in the movie scoring business. And um, so we asked him if he would score that, that opening credit song, if he would write that. And we had a specific singer that's also a friend of ours that we wanted to sing that. And they did such a you know great job, and they seemed to really love the cut of the movie. And then I was like, hey, so I've got fifty cents. Would you score the entire film? And he and he said yes. So he brought um, Tim Adams on. So Mike and Tim they they composed almost all of the music, even even a lot of the background music that you hear in the cafes. We did license some songs, but a lot of those were even you know friends and stuff like. Um, our closing credit song is one of the Indigo Girls, who I, you know, had met through another friend who composed the song with her, and so it was like that, a, a big labor of love, but I had laid in a very meticulous temp score, so I knew exactly the kind of music that I wanted, and I wanted it to have a real indie edge, and I wanted all female vocalists, and they were able to take that temp score and make it actually even better and bring on you know the likes of like Tracy Bonham, Anara George, um, Drug Rug, like these incredible indie artists that I'm you know fans of and they were able to you know talk them into doing it. Nicole Atkins and just a lot of really wonderful female vocalists. And so I like it that there was you know men who wrote the music but it's it's women who are singing it. So I like that kind of combo of, of the two genders. Anybody else? Thank you so much. This was such a great, such a great audience. Thank you. Thank you.